another $250 million, uh, uh, yeah, $250,000 a year to those 120,000 families and raise taxes for people who are middle income with a child by $2,000 a year. This is unconscionable. There is no need for this. The middle class got knocked on their heels. The Great Recession crushed them. They need some help now. The last people who need help are 120,000 families for another, another $500 billion tax cut over the next 10 years. Congressman. <clears throat> Our entire premise of these tax reform plans is to grow the economy and create jobs. It's a plan that's estimated to create 7 million jobs. Now, we think that government taking 28% of a family and business's income is enough. President Obama thinks that the government ought to be able to take as much as 44.8% of a small business's income. Look, if you taxed every person in successful small business making over $250,000 at 100%, it only run the government for 98 days. If everybody who paid income taxes last year, including successful small businesses, doubled their income taxes this year, we'd still have a $300 billion deficit. You see, there aren't enough rich people and small businesses to tax to pay for all their spending. And so the next time you hear them say, don't worry about it, we'll get a few wealthy people to pay their fair share, watch out, middle class, the tax bill is coming to you. That's why we're saying we need fundamental tax reform. Let's take a look at it this way. Eight out of 10 businesses, they file their taxes as individuals, not as corporations. And where I come from overseas, which is Lake Superior, <laughs> the Canadians, they drop their tax rates to 15%. The average tax rate on businesses in the industrialized world is 25%, and the president wants the top effective tax rate on successful small businesses to go above 40%. Two thirds of our jobs come from small businesses. This one tax would actually tax about 53% of small business income. It's expected to cost us 710,000 jobs. And you know what? It doesn't even pay for 10% of their proposed deficit spending increases. What we are saying is lower tax rates across the board and close loopholes primarily to the higher income people. We have three bottom lines. Don't raise the deficit, don't raise taxes on the middle class, and don't lower the share of income that is borne by the high income earners. He'll keep saying this $5 trillion plan, I suppose. It's been discredited by six <laughs> other studies, and even their own deputy campaign manager acknowledged that it wasn't correct. Well, well let's, let's uh, talk about this 20%. <laughs> you have refused, and again, to offer specifics on how you pay for that 20% across the board tax cut. Do you actually have the specifics, or are you still working on it, and that's why you won't tell voters? Different than this administration, we actually want to have big bipartisan agreements. You see, I understand that. Do you have the specifics? Do you have the maps? Do you know exactly what you're Republican doing? Republican look, Congress. <laughs> look, at what Mitt Ro look at what Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill did. They worked together out of a framework to lower tax rates and broaden the base, and they worked together to fix that. What we're saying is, here's our framework. Lower tax rates, 20%. We raise about $1.2 trillion through income taxes. We forego about $1.1 trillion in loopholes and deductions. And so what we're saying is, deny those loopholes and deductions to higher income taxpayers so that more of their income is taxed, which has a broader base of taxation, so we can lower tax rates across the board. Now, here's why I'm saying this. What we're saying is, here's the framework. I hope I'm going to get time to respond we to this. Want to I, I, you'll Congress. get time. We want to work with Congress on how best to achieve this. That means successful. Look, no specific. Mitt, yeah. What we're saying is lower tax rates 20%, start with the wealthy, work with Congress and to do it. And you guarantee this math will add up. Absolutely. Six studies have guaranteed, six studies have verified that this math adds up. But Vice here's President the Biden, Look, Vice President, President Biden, Biden. Let me translate. Let, let me have a chance to translate. I'll come back here. in a second then, right? First of all, I was there when Ronald Reagan tax breaks, when he gave specifics of what he was going to cut. No, number one, in terms of tax expenditures. Mm -hmm. Number two, 97% of the small businesses in America pay less, make less than $250,000. Let me tell you who some of those other small businesses are. Hedge funds that make six, eight hundred million dollars a year. That, that's what they count as small businesses because they're passed through. Let's look at how sincere they are. Ronald, I mean, excuse me, uh, Governor Romney on 60 Minutes, I guess it was about 10 days ago, was asked, Governor, you pay 14% on $20 million. Someone making $50,000 pays more than that. Do you think that's fair? He said, oh yes, that's fair. That's fair. 
This is, and they're going to talk about, you think these guys are going to go out there and cut those loopholes? The loophole, the biggest loophole they take advantage of is the carried interest loophole and, and capital gains loophole. They exempt that. Now, there's not enough. The reason why the AEI study, the American Enterprise Institute study, the Tax Policy Center study, the reason they all say it's going to, taxes are going to go up in the middle class, the only way you can find $5 trillion in loopholes is cut the mortgage deduction for middle class people. People. Cut the health care deduction, middle class people. Take away their ability to get a tax break to send their kids to college. That's why they arrive. Is arriving. he wrong about that? He is wrong about that. There, you, can, that? you can cut tax rates by 20 percent and still preserve these important preferences for middle class taxpayers. Not mathematically it, possible. It is mathematically possible. It's been done before. It's precisely what we're proposing. <laughs> it has never been done before. It's been done a couple of times. Actually. It has never. Jack been Jack Kennedy done lowered tax rates, increased growth. Ronald oh, Reagan. Oh, now you're Jack Kennedy. Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Republicans and Democrats. Republicans and Democrats have worked together on this. You know, I understand right. you guys aren't used but to doing bipartisan deals. But we told each other deals. what we're going to do when we did it with Republicans Reagan. And Democrats, we said, "Here, here are the we things said, we're going to cut." Framework. Let's Here's work what he together said. to fill in the details. That's exactly. Fill in the details. That's how you get things done. You work with Congress. Look, let me say it this way. Mitt That's Romney coming was from the Republican Congress working Mitt, bipartisanly. Mitt Romney. Seven percent rating. Mitt Romney oh. was governor of Massachusetts, where 87 percent of the legislators he served with were Democrats. He didn't demonize them. He didn't demagogue them. He met with those party leaders every week. <laughs> he reached across the aisle. He didn't compromise principles. And you he saw common ground, and he balanced the budget. You saw it. If he, he did such a great job, job, if he did such a great job in Massachusetts, without raising taxes, why isn't he even contesting Massachusetts? Vice President, what, what would you Isn't suggest? It? What would you suggest beyond raising taxes on the wealthy that would substantially reduce Not the Just let the taxes expire like they're supposed to on those millionaires. We don't, we can't afford $800 billion going to people making a minimum of a million dollars. They do not need it, Martha. Those 120,000 families make $8 million a year. Middle class people need the help. Why does my friend cut out the tuition tax credit for them? Why does he go after can the child care? Can you declare anything off Why limits? Do they can do you that? declare anything off limits? Yeah, we're home saying close loopholes on high interest people. Home mortgage deduction. For higher income people. Here. Can you guarantee this, that no one this taxes, making less than $100,000 will have a mortgage, this, their mortgage deduction impacted? This taxes guarantee? a million small businesses. He keeps trying to make you think that it's just some movie star or hedge fund guy. 97% of the small businesses make less than $250,000 a year would not be you know affected. It hits a million pe this taxes a million people? A million small Does businesses? Does it tax 97% of the American it, it businesses? It taxes a million small, small businesses. businesses who are our greatest job creators. I wish I could get it. The greatest job creators. And you're going, going to increase the about defense budget. Way. And you're going to increase the defense no, We're just budget. not going to cut the defense budget like they're, they're proposing. You're going $2 billion. That's $2 not trillion. accurate. More we're than talking that. about no, So no massive No, we're saying defense don't, increase. Okay, you want to get into let, defense now? Let, yes, I All do. Right. I do. So, because that's another math question. Right. Okay. How do you do that? So they proposed a $478 billion cut to defense to begin with. Now we have another $500 billion cut to defense that's lurking on the horizon. They insisted upon that cut being involved in the debt negotiations. Let, let, and so now we let's have a one Let's put the automatic cut. defense cuts right. aside, okay? okay? Let's so put those like aside. No that. one wants okay. that. But I want to know how you do the math and have this increase in defense Two trillion spending. trillion dollars. You don't cut defense by a trillion dollars. That's what we're talking about. And the, what, what national trillion. security issues Who's justify an trillion? increase? We're going to cut 80,000 soldiers, 20,000 Marines, 120 cargo planes. We're going to push the joint strike Drawing fire down out. We're cutting missile more, defense. And one more. If we these cuts go through, our Navy will be the smallest it has, it, the smallest it has been since before <sighs> World War I. This invites weakness. Look, do we believe in peace through strength? You bet we do. And that means you don't impose these devastating cuts on our military. So we're saying don't cut the military by a trillion dollars. Not increase it by a trillion, don't cut it by a trillion dollars. Quickly, Vice President Biden, on this, Look, and I want to move on. We don't cut it. And I might add, this so-called, I know we don't want to use the fancy word sequester, this automatic cut, that was part of a debt deal that they asked for. And let me tell you what my friend said at a press conference announcing his support of the deal. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, we've been looking for this moment for a long time. Can I tell you what that meant? 
We've been looking for bipartisanship for a long time. And so the bipartisanship is what he voted for, the automatic cuts in defense if they didn't act. And beyond that, they asked for another. Look, the military says we need a smaller, leaner army. We need more special forces. We need, we don't need more M1 tanks. What we need is more UAVs. Some of the military. I know that's something Not some of the military. That was the decision of the Joint Chiefs of Staff recommended to us and agreed to by the president. Who answered the facts. civilian leader? They made the recommendation first. Okay, let's move on to Afghanistan. Uh, can I, I get into that I'd like to move on to Afghanistan, okay. please. And that's one of the biggest expenditures this country has made in dollars and, more importantly, in lives. We just passed the sad milestone of losing 2,000 U.S. troops there in this war. More than 50 of them were killed this year by the very Afghan forces we are trying to help. Now, we've reached the recruiting goal for Afghan forces. We've degraded al-Qaeda. So tell me, why not leave now? What more can we really accomplish? Is it worth more American lives? We don't want to lose the gains we've gotten. We want to make sure that the Taliban does not come back in and give al-Qaeda a safe haven. We agree with the administration on their 2014 transition. Look, when I think about Afghanistan, I think about the incredible job that our troops have done. You've been there more than the two of us combined. First time I was there in 2002, it was amazing to me what they were facing. And I went to the Argandab Valley in Kandahar before the surge. I sat down with a young private in the 82nd from the Menominee Indian Reservation who would tell me what he did every day, and I was in awe. And to see what they had in front of them, and then to go back there in December, to go throughout Hellman with the Marines to see what they had accomplished, it's nothing short of amazing. What we don't want to do is lose the gains we've gotten. Now, we've disagreed from time to time on a few issues. We would have more likely taken into account the recommendations from our commanders, General Petraeus, Admiral Mullen, on troop levels throughout this year's fighting season. We've been skeptical about negotiations with the Taliban, especially while they're shooting at us. But we want to see the 2014 transition be successful. And that means we want to make sure our commanders have what they need to make sure that it is successful so that this does not once again become a launching pad for terrorists. Vice Martha, President Biden. let's keep our eye on the ball. The reason I've been in and out of Afghanistan and Iraq 20 times. I've been up in the Konar Valley. I've been throughout that whole country, mostly in a helicopter and sometimes in a vehicle. Um, the fact is we went there for one reason, to get those people who killed Americans, Al-Qaeda, We've decimated Al-Qaeda Central. We have eliminated Osama bin Laden. That was our purpose. And in fact, in the meantime, what we said we would do, we would help train the Afghan military. It's their responsibility to take over their own security. That's why with 50, 49 of our allies in Afghanistan, we've agreed on a gradual drawdown, so we're out of there by the year 20, in the year 2014. My friend and the governor say it's based on conditions, which means it depends. It does not depend for us. It is the responsibility of the Afghans to take care of their own security. We have trained over 315,000, mostly without incident. There have been more than two dozen cases of green on blue where Americans have been killed. If we do not, if the, if the measures the military has taken do not take hold, we will not go on joint patrols. We will not train in the field. We'll only train in the, uh, in the army bases that exist there. But we are leaving. We are leaving in 2014, period. And in the process, we're going to be saving over the next 10 years another 800 billion dollars. We've been in this war for over a decade. The obje primary objective is almost completed. Now all we're doing is putting the Kabul government in a position to be able to maintain their own security. It's their responsibility, not America's. What, what conditions could justify staying, Congressman Ryan? We don't want to stay. We want, look, one of my best friends in Janesville, a uh, reservist, is at a forward operating base in eastern Afghanistan right now. Our wives are best friends, our daughters are best friends. I want, I want him and all of our troops to come home as soon and safely as possible. We want to make sure that 2014 is successful. That's why we want to make sure 
that we give our commanders what they say they need to make it successful. We don't want to extend beyond 2014. That's the point we're making. You know, if it was